Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started right now. Just going to, there we go, not screen sharing anymore. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, welcome to Reimagine Theater, a panel series that brings artists and community leaders together to envision a new theatrical world. My name is Nebra Nelson. I'm the Director of Arts Engagement at Seattle Rep. I'll give a physical description for blind and low vision audiences. Um, I am a lighter skinned woman with short brown hair, a teal shirt, and behind me is a black and white photo. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. This acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, but serves as a first step in honoring the land we are on. And if you wanna know more about indigenous communities and organizations that are local to the Seattle area, you can check out the uh, land acknowledgement page on the Seattle Rep website. I want to take a moment to thank everyone who's working for black justice in myriad ways in the face of so much injustice, Brianna Taylor's uh, trial notwithstanding. Black Lives Matter, and I deeply appreciate every one of the panelists being here to have this conversation today. We're doing these panels so that we can envision a future of equity and justice and imagine what that might look like um, and how the arts and theater sector specifically should be a part of that and be con a consistent part of community voice. So the leading questions for this discussion are, if you could wave a ma magic wand and build a new theater landscape, what would you create? What is the a theater landscape that centers black voices equitably? And what does theater at the heart of public life look like? So now I'm going to pass it along to Alex Reed, my co-facilitator for this panel and the rest of the panelists so they can introduce themselves. Thanks, Navra. I am Alex Lee Reed. I am the Youth Engagement Manager at Seattle Rep. I will describe myself. I am a light-skinned black person with black locks with red tips up in a bun, uh, wearing a yellow sweater. And behind me is a fish tank and a bookshelf. Um, like I said, I'm the Youth Engagement Manager at Seattle Rep which means that I take my lead from the young people and educators in our community. Um, I also am a playwright, director, and sometimes performer, um, community cheerleader. Um, I would like to go ahead and throw it to our panelists to each introduce themselves. I suppose I will give you an order. Um, so panelists, when you introduce yourselves, um, feel free to share whatever you want to about who you are as humans, as artists, and what your connection is to theater and community here in Seattle. Um, I'll go ahead and throw it to Donald Bird up first. Uh-oh, you are on mute. Right, I knew it was going to be me because I didn't want to go first. So uh, the universe has a way of doing that. Uh, uh, my name is Donald Bird. Uh, I am the artistic director at Spectrum Dance Theater. I am a, I guess I'm medium brown complected black person. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm sitting in my office and behind me are a bunch of boxes that has archival material in it. Uh, it in fact, this room is a mess. Uh, so <laughs> it's just like my life in some ways, you know? Uh, so anyway, that's what, that's what it looks like. I think the question was what, uh, what my relationship is to Seattle. I mean, Spectrum Dance Theater has been a part. I mean, I've been here since 2002. December 1, 2002 was my first day work, and I have uh, tried and uh, to really engage myself with the with the Seattle community. One of the things that over the the course of the top 17, almost 18 years that I've been here, is 
what I've noticed is the emergence of more black and uh, people of color uh, dance folk because that's where I work primarily. But I think also seeing uh, more black people in general uh, practitioners involved in the theater and to me, young people, and that is really, really, really exciting. That's the most exciting thing about living here now for me is seeing that. Thanks, Donald. Uh, Sharon? Thank you, Alex. Hi, Donald, love you. Um, hello, everyone. I am uh, Sharon Nairi Williams. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am a caramel complexion. Uh, I have um, some tan locks uh, falling over my right eye. Um, on, behind me, I have a red and black curtain and a red, black, and yellow painting and just darkness um, for effect. Um, and I'm wearing a black shirt with um, feed worldwide on it and blue and gold. Yes, um, that's a whole nother story. Um, so I am the executive director for the Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas. We present, produce, develop Black artists and um, share Black experiences. Um, we have been around for over 21 years. I've been running the organization going on eight. Woo woo. Um, and it was founded by um, Stephanie Ellis Smith specifically for um, the Central District and knowing that at the time the Central District um, was the Black hub for um, Black people and felt as though we needed um, more work that created, created what that was thought provoking. I'm also a storyteller. I do it in various genres from poetry to solo performance. Um, and I've been in working in the arts in Seattle for over 16 years. Um, and one of my first early on gigs in getting introduced to the theater community was as an intern at the Seattle Rep. Um, and what I, what I like about where I am in Seattle is that I found myself here um, I've been able to live my dream here in working with the arts and uplifting Black voices. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Sharon. Julie, hello. Hello. Um, my name is Julie Ferris. Uh, in my paid job, I am an attorney in Seattle. Um, I am a native Seattleite, um, so I can remember when all of y'all arrived on the scene and uh, an enthusiastic arts consumer and supporter. Uh, I am a member of the Board of Trustees for the Seattle Rep um, and have been a board member for other um, arts organizations. Um, in my adult life and um, mostly just enthusiastic about the arts and theater and dance um, as an audience member and as a member of this community. Thank you, Julie. Well, Valerie, hello. Hi, Alex. Um, for the listeners, I am a uh, I would say, at least at this point in the fall, I would call myself a milk chocolate black woman with gap teeth and gray hair. Uh, in the middle of winter, that would be a different description completely. Uh, I'm currently the head of directing at the University of Washington School of Drama. And I'm one of the co-founders and artistic director of the Hansberry Project which is a, a black theater company here in Seattle. Um, we celebrate, support, and present the work of black theater artists. Um, I'm a freelance director and have worked at many theaters around town. And uh, my, in my spare time, I do write a little bit. I finally finished this play I've, I've had for five years. So I'm ready to like let it loose. Um, and I think the only other thing I would say about my relationship to this community is that um, I arrived here as a graduate student. 
and found a way to make a life here and am still here working. I also now, because I'm at the I'm at the age I'm at, that I get to actually do work in other parts of the country. And so being able to call Seattle my home and use it as a launching pad to get to the other places I want to get to has been a really, uh, really useful and powerful experience. I'm very committed to the people of this city, and I especially want to see Black artists thrive. So thank you, Alex. Thank you, Val. Ms. Toya Taylor. Hey. Hey, Alex. I knew you were going to make me go after Valerie. I called it, too. I knew it. But that's my sister, and I love her, so it's an honor. Um, I would describe myself as a bronze hue, melanated sister with high cheekbones passed down from my West Indian ancestors, uh, almond-shaped eyes that I adore from my father. Um, I have braids right now that go down my back midsection um, and a, a smile that I, I, I radiate, I think, um, and, and it tells how I feel about blackness and how I feel about children. So when you see me smile, those are the things that I'm, I'm thinking about and I'm proud about. Um, I am the founder of We App, We Act, Present and Perform, which is a public speaking organization for children in Seattle Public Schools. It's the only public speaking class offered during the day as part of curriculum. And what we do is we take children who are silent, are silenced in the back of the classroom and we teach them how to be the voices. We teach them how to be bold in the front. And so my medium, I, I, I came into this world as a spoken word artist and, uh, but my, my life passion is oratory, speaking into existence who we are and how we see ourselves. Thank you, Toya. And finally, Deidre. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm so excited and grateful to be here in this virtual room with all these amazing people. Um, my name is Deidre Woods. I am a, yes, it's still in the summer, so kind of medium brown skin, uh, black woman with short to shortish medium uh, hair, twist out. Um, in my background, I have a orange and kind of yellow faux flower. I'm wearing a green shirt. And I am an actor, a uh, storyteller, um, and I am the creator of a digital platform called Artists of Color Seattle, AOC 206, where I, our mission, my mission is to uplift the voices of uh, Black, brown, indigenous people of color, artists here in Seattle and beyond, um, giving voice to our artistry, our activism, and our heart's desires um, through a non-white gaze. Um, I've been in Seattle about since 2012, which seems crazy, um, working primarily as an actor, but also I'm an educator too. So I love the babies. I work with the kids. Um, and my passion for uh, lifting Black voices is only growing during this time. So I'm grateful for this conversation that we're having now. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Deidre. And thank you all for being here. Um, so the way this is going to roll, um, we're going to start with our guiding question. Um, and then we'll let the conversation kind of go the way that it goes. I've got some questions in mind that we may get to in this conversation or we may not. But what's really important here what feels really important here is to give all of you opportunity and space to just speak honestly on the world of theater that we want to and will create together. Um, so that being said, our first kind of driving question, if you could wave a magic wand and build a totally new, from scratch, from the ground up, 
theater landscape. What what does that look like? What does what does it feel essential to have in this world? What is the dream? Draw it out for us. Um, anyone feel free. I think we'll find kind of the best rhythm. I don't want to put anyone on the spot necessarily just yet. So, um, Alex, I'll, I'll jump in because that's what I do. I jump in. I love that. I think that the foundation of whatever this new landscape is going to be, it's going to rest on the equ equitable distribution of resources. So that if we have the money to build the thing strong and high, it'll be built strong and high. Um, what many uh, global majority organizations spend their time doing is trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. So uh, in order for us to really ha allow our imaginations to flourish, we've got to be able to not only have the vision, but then have the resources to make the vision tangible. Um, so I think that equitable resources is one. I think a commitment to truth telling is another, right? So that everybody can tell the truth of their experience. And I think that that's a 360 degree experience when you can tell the truth. I can tell all the bad things because I can tell all the good things and and promote an accurate depiction of my community in particular. I think that, so that's the second thing. And then I think the last thing is an audience that is willing to go on the ride uh, and willing to be exposed to things beyond their immediate experience. So that's, that's, where, I, that's where I would start. Thank you, Val. Does anyone else? Um, I'll jump in. Um, I I totally agree with everything that Val said, and I had truth telling on my list of things to say as well. But um, but in addition to what Val said, freedom, um, freedom to enter spaces and to be ourselves, and to have the freedom to communicate to whomever theaters put together as a team. Um, our truth and not being um, judged or misjudged about um, how we see ourselves in our community. Also um, seeing us beyond, not seeing us beyond color, I would never say that, but seeing that we have skills that translate um, in programming that isn't um, necessarily black. Valerie Curtis Newton and Donald Byrd can direct any kind of show um, if they're giving the opportunity to, although the love is for telling black stories, um, just like they allow white directors to direct black shows, I don't understand why it isn't in reverse. Um, I think an equitable theater has that in place. I also think humanity of not thinking that you know who we are and allowing us to say who we are. Um, and not know, just because you've been around us, know that we've been around you just as long and studying you. Um, we have, I was thinking about it last night, we've been force fed white culture. If you ask me my favorite shows as a child, they would be Young and the Restless, Not Slanding, Falcon Crest. Um, as the world turns. And then as a teenager, the Cosby show. So um, I think I think we have to be allowed to do our work and be respected for our work, no matter what space we're in. Thank you. I'll go next. Um... I would say it's uh, everything, everything Valerie and, and Sharon said in terms of free reign. It's the freedom to interpret and adapt and reimagine our work in our words, in our bodies. Um, it's where institutional leaders step aside and share the power. So when we look at leadership and middle management, it's time to paint the White House black meaning we need more black producers, board members, uh, artistic directors at the forefront 
at the helm of what is going on. So um, those are some of the things and how I would echo what's already been said. Can I, can I just for one second, Toya said something that really sparked something in me, which is um, I'm, I'm not so interested in white folks stepping aside because that would leave us to take over institutions that are not prepared for us. Mm. I don't want you to go in and lead Seattle Rep until they've done their board work mm. and done their funder work to make it a, a, an environment where you can actually get things done. For us to move into environments that are inherently racist or oppressive doesn't is not the best use of our our energies. So I, I want us to have all those resources, but I'm not sure until they have done that work that we should be really hungry to lead those organizations. I, I totally agree with you, but I just feel like that caveat is very important. Thank you. I, I agree with what everything that's been said. And I'd also like to throw in the mix, you know, really making the spaces safe for artists who come into the rooms. You know, there's been an outcry from Seattle Black theater artists as to what we need in order to come back into these spaces. You know, people are hungry to create their own spaces. And I think money is a big uh, barrier. Um, but I've talked about this with other people, you know, the way we think about donors and who is a donor and who has the right to give money also needs to be reimagined. I think people want, there are black people in this town who want to support theater, but they don't see themselves. They see themselves on the stage maybe once or twice in a season, but then they don't see other people who look like them in the audiences. They don't see other people who look like them, you know, approaching them to ask them if they're willing to become a part of the organization. I think um, leadership and how the expectations of who a leader is, you can't expect a, a black or brown person sometimes to come to the table with the same things that you have because they haven't been afforded the same privileges to be able to sometimes get that education that they may need in order to step in that position. So being open with your resources and really doing the work, I think you have to do the work. We can't come back from this at the end and people say, oh, that was a nice little break because we've been working since before this started and I don't like the idea that, okay, now something's happening. For black people, we have been toiling through racial discrimination and being discriminated in the theater since day one. So now you just join the party. So what are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. I wanna string together um, things that um, the three of you have said um, as a person who is, in this board room that we're trying to give access to, because I think um, I appreciate Valerie's point about not wanting to take over an inherently racist institution, but I do think there there's kind of a seesaw there because these changes that we're talking about aren't going to happen, even with the well-intentioned, um, hey, now we're with you that Deidre was talking about, unless there's somebody else in the room to do it. And when there are too few of us there, the changes don't happen um, quickly enough. So I agree that it, it doesn't necessarily work for everybody who's in there right now to get up and walk out the door and say, here, you take it over now. But I do think we have to figure out how to, to open and ex accept and make um, acceptable, um, to make it so that people who aren't there are willing and, and able and comfortable in participating so that the changes can be made in the right direction. It's not just a bunch of well-intentioned, but really, um, you know, so often misguided and um, people who are still part of the problem um, 
making the decisions on the solution. Yeah, Julie, I agree 100%. And I, I guess in my brain, I want to have our own stuff to invest in ourselves. And I want to be able to speak truth in every room that I go into. Um, and so I do that. I, I'm not on the rep's board, but I can tell you that people at the rep know what I think about how they should be engaging in our community. I agree. And so I think that it is very, it's, it's entirely possible to support them and hold them accountable for cleaning up their own house. And, uh, and I, I don't, I'm not saying by any means just leave them to their own devices. I'm just saying that they have their own work to do and uh, encouraging them to think about stepping aside so we can do their work, that doesn't make sense to me. And I'm glad that there are people like you who are in the rooms who are saying, you know, what, why, why is that decision being made again? Um, and I think that there are people outside who need to be outside and stay outside in order to put the right pressure where it needs to be. But I don't disagree with you at all about engaging them, but we have to engage them on our terms. Uh, I just wanna throw something in here, maybe a little, uh, what's the word? I'm looking for uh, metaphysical on some level. <laughs> But this idea that the the default seems to be when we talk, when we say people, we actually mean white people. And I would like to not have that be that if we mean white people, we say white people because we say black people when we mean black people. And I think that's part of the, the, the I mean, it says something about how, uh, I mean, I, I hate, this phrase in some ways that we've been colonized, but it's a reality and that, that, that uh, white people are the default. And so in the, because we then we have to go back and explain what we mean, you know, that, I, I, you know, so if we just should say white people, I think, and I'm not directing this at you guys, but I mean, I do it for myself too. I always have to go, I mean, white people. Uh, and so I think that, uh, that, institutions that are uh, are white led and run and that benefit and uh, white communities. Uh, I think the, the issue that Valerie brought up was, do we really want to go into to that institution or those kinds of, do we need to, are there different kinds of institutions or institutions that reflect Black interests and sensibilities are those the kind of institutions that we really want to support or that we want to see be supported right now by uh, by uh, white uh, organizations that, you know, funders and donors and stuff like that. We want them to support, not to reinforce something that is already there, but this this other thing that Black people are doing and people of color are doing. I mean, we're doing something different. And so the thing is that what we're doing different always stays on the outside. And in these white institutions, they only want a little bit of that. Come in a little bit and you do a little bit, then please go away, you know? And so I think uh, one of the things that's always interesting to me about how people respond, white people uh, respond, to, respond to my work here in Seattle, they go, oh, it, you know, it made me uncomfortable. And I, you know, and I, think that black people are you don't expect that the theater is not going to make them feel uncomfortable that that's part of our experience in life that things make us feel uncomfortable and when we are made to feel or when we feel un or we feel uncomfortable about something we ask the question why am I feeling uncomfortable about this rather than oh I want to push it away I don't want to feel anything please go away you know like that So I hear I hear um, several several ideas. I hear in this new newly imagined landscape, uh, we need an equitable distribution of resources. We need freedom and commitment to truth telling. We need, at the end of the day, an audience willing to go along with us. 
Um, I wonder if each of you, here's a little challenge in a couple of, in a couple of words, uh, what are, what are our, what are our pillars? If that's the foundation that we're building on, right? Then what do we, what do we want to see grow from that? I'm interested in uh, encouraging people to uh, achieve the fullness of their human potential, which means being brave and compassionate and curious and risk-taking and truth-telling, like to make the conditions where as many people as encounter our work feel they exit feeling a step closer to those things. That's the, that's for me, that's communion, which is the whole reason to have theater, right? Communion is creating the conditions for everyone to be their best selves. And that's why I make theater because I want to do that. I want to contribute to that. Wow. So that's, that's what I, that for me would be in service of that idea. I, I just wonder from what Valerie just said, which is really the, the, that this, uh, are we, the exception and not the rule, meaning that I wonder if the majority of the people out there in the world really want the kind, or Americans in particular, want this experience that Valerie is talking about. Do they really want that? I see we want that, and you know, but I'm 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 not convinced because I think that uh, uh, that there. To add on to a kind of a, a, a wish, a hope, is that people, as to kind of build on what Valerie was just saying, that people will think for themselves. And that the way to think for yourself is really the, 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 the is a kind of education and being, you know, kind of a, a, acknowledging that you need to do certain kinds of work and then you go about doing, educating yourself in order to be able to do, in order to be able to, uh, to be, to, to have your own thoughts and not thoughts that have been inherited uh, from someplace else or gotten from someplace else. Well, that's a really excellent thought. Are we the exception? I guess part of me feels like that's the place where we lead. Our, I think our job is partly to go out and look and explore and catalog and be a pioneer and collect observations and then weave them into something artistic and then deliver it back out. And maybe people see themselves or they see a possibility in the work we make. But um, I think our being exceptional actually is, is part of what it is to be an artist. Entezaki, Entezaki Shange once said to me, to be an artist is to be outside the people, but closer to God. And I, I think about that all the time when I'm making something and I think, is anyone going to come or are they going to care? And then I'm like, oh, I'm just called to make this thing, so I make it. But I, I think that it's a really valid question. Are we the exception? I, I, I hope we are, which is why I think the art will be good if we are the exception and looking for this higher thing. I also, I oh, sorry. Um, uh, and Donald, and piggybacking off of what you said, I think um, people haven't had the opportunity to know if they want what we have um, because they haven't had much of it. So therefore, um, <laughs> Duchess, um, therefore, they they don't know. They know if you're in a regional theater, they may see a show once or twice. If they come to CD Forum, you see black bodies every show that we do. And I think because of that, I think the, the thing that people hide, the thing that white people hide behind is that, or white leaders hide behind is that I don't think our audiences will accept this work. Um, because that's not what they're into. But how do you know when you haven't had a full season of just black bodies or Latinx bodies or BIPOC, BIPOC period bodies? So how do you know that's not what they want? When I started performing in Seattle, 
my first show was at Seattle U for the, for the law school. I walked out and the entire room was white with a few black people sprinkled in. So how do they know? I, I think that we assume and that as, as leaders assume that because they've been, it's been working for them or so-called working from them, the way in which they've been doing it, that that's the way it has to keep going. But I dare a, a regional theater to have an all black season and see what happens, see who shows up. And then they'll know whether or not um, their audience wants us on the stage. I think I, I agree, Sharon. And I think that the uh, another point in that regard is that when they're making their assumptions about what our art is, they assume that all it is is a chance to bang on white people. Like white people are the center of everything we do, but that's not that's not in fact the case. But that's one of the assumptions. I don't want to go to the theater and watch a bunch of black people talk bad about white folks, so I'm not going to go. Um, or all the black art is angry because the truth hurts. But so, or they can't understand. Like what? What they did? What did they just say? Was that English? I don't know what they talking about. I can't figure it out. But you can figure it out when you listen to a hip hop song. Yeah, and it feels like uh, you know white theaters are more interested in showcasing and celebrating our pain, putting our pain on display for adulation instead of our moments of joy and just showing black people in their humanness, which is what we are as human. So, you know, the shows that do get picked at most of these primarily white institutions, a lot of times are very traumatic for black audiences. So as a black person, you go to the show and you sit in there and you're are surrounded by white people and you're witnessing a lot of times trauma on stage and haven't been warned there's no warning in the program for you and so then you're experiencing another type of trauma when having to be surrounded by this audience who can't relate to what you're experiencing on stage so i think part of the reimagining is expanding what storytelling is and how black storytelling does not fit in this monolithic mode of it's just me, I'm going to talk to an audience, you know, this theater dynamic that we've been taught is that's the way, that's the only way to have a performance is if you're sitting in an audience and then someone's on stage in front of you and they're performing, that's what the quote unquote theater is. Thanks, Deidre. That, uh, sorry, um, that actually leads into a question that I really, really want to ask this room. You know, I know we're, we are constantly, right? We are in the midst of revolution. We're thinking all the time about what we need to burn down in order to build up. But what I want to know from all of you right now is like, what, what are, what are the stories that we want to tell? What does our, our, our art look like when it's not created for, through, or with the lens of whiteness? Read Val's play. What? <laughs> Thank you for the plug, Deidre. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I, I mean, what I, you know, the thing is that I, I, I think it's like, I'm really interested in in general, I think what we want to see, Black people want to see, is stuff that somehow that addresses our experiences, uh, our, our dreams, our hopes, uh, our history, and however it does that. It doesn't mean that it needs to be told in the, the, you know, the kitchen sink dramas of the late 50s and 60s, that it can be done, it can manifest itself in the many ways that the Black imagination uh, has at its disposal. And so, I mean, we, earlier I was thinking so much about uh, the production that Valerie did of Trouble in Mind and how the history behind that play and, uh, and this idea of that, if you, at how Alice Childress was really bold in saying, this is the play that I, is my play, this is the play that I want to present to the public, not some other version of it. And so, some other reality that makes white people feel okay about themselves. You know, that's not what I want to do. And so it just kind of made me think also about uh, 
uh, what is it, uh, Ruined. I mean, I, I liked Ruined, but the ending of the play just did not sit with me. And somebody said to me, that's not the ending that she originally wrote. She wrote another ending and the white theater institutions that were had commissioned it and were doing, they said, no, nope, you have to do another ending. And so I want a theater, the stories that I wanna see are stories told by black people within their truth, not accommodating white institutions or white audiences. And as Valerie said, it doesn't mean that it has to be about trauma or about angry and, 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 and mad all the time about stuff. But there is, there's just more variety to, to us than that. But I do want it not to be, uh, how do you say it? Uh, the people, black people that are telling our stories, if you're gonna support them, support them. Don't tell them what to, how to write or what it is that they're doing or how to direct what they're, what they're directing. Um, there, personally, for me, there are two kinds of plays that I gravitate towards. I gravitate towards plays that are about people finding their voices. And I also gravitate toward plays where Black people heal their relationships with each other. So we can go through trauma. We can go through being abandoned. We can go through being abused. We can go through all that stuff. But if we f are, are figuring out how we love each other through it, how we get to the other side of it, then that for me is a story worth telling. But every, every artist has their own sort of litmus test. Like, what is it that lights you up? You know, for some people, it's making musicals. And I think musicals are wonderful and I love them. I do have a problem when all white people only want to hear us sing, right? The opposite of trauma porn is the happy Negro who's always singing. Uh -huh. There's got to be something between those two poles that can merit spending money on to go see, to make number one, to make, and number two, to go see. But we get caught in those two camps altogether too much. Uh -huh. You so know, I want to ask a question after listening to all of you. Do you think that what Donald was describing or what others have been describing about what they want, can that exist in what we're now calling the white theater or does that traditional thing have to die entirely and burn to the ground to be replaced with something else? before you get to the point that Donald was describing where people put on the work they want to put on without being told how to do it? That's a great question. Thank you, Julie. I think, Julie, we have to change the metrics for success. If we decide that only X amount of money or X percentage of butts and seats is the measure of success of an artistic work, then we're going to constantly be chasing, trying to find the right model to get people to show up and spend their money. Yeah. There, there, there might be other metrics that can be applied in addition to, to funding, to selling tickets. You know, there's always going to be a show in a season that does not make money. Why can't the theater think about those plays as investments in particular audiences? Right? Why does the one black play have to make X amount of dollars? Why can't it just be an opportunity for these artists to make work that could be a, a gift to the community if they come to see it? So I feel like we need to have a real discussion about the measures of success and agree on a community standard about what that is inside these organizations. Um, but yeah, I feel like, I feel like that's a really important point I don't know that it all has to burn down and go away, but it definitely can't continue to stand the way it's standing and tell the lie that it is interested in communities of color. They can do what they're doing, but they just have to stop saying what they're saying because the integrity of having your words and your deeds match is a place where I find so many of the predominantly white institutions, that's where they fall down. 
they have a really great sense of what they want their mission to be, and then they don't actually do anything in service of that mission. So I, I, I would just like to see those things align. You know, I'm in this time of COVID, I've always, I keep saying, and I probably say it three times, four times a day that COVID is the best and the worst of us, right? But I've learned so much during this time frame and this period. And the, the two words that keep coming up for me is collective power, right. collective power. And when I look at Freedom Georgia, where uh, um, I think it was 19 families came together and bought 94 acres of land to create their own town, their own foundation, I say that we do, we can do the same thing in all of the, our, you know, facets of our lives. And the beauty, you know, about theater is theater doesn't have to necessarily be in the confines of four walls. Theater can be done anywhere. And Black people, we are resilient. People of color, we are resilient. We are, imagin we are imaginative. We are creative. We don't, we create our own. We can create our own collective power. I'll never forget when I worked at Harlem School of the Arts and the classical theater of Harlem that was founded by a white man named Alfred Pricer, who was the founder as well as the artistic director. He was directing Macbeth, an all black cast. And um, I remember watching the artists come on stage to audition. And afterwards, Alfred said, so much talent in the room, so many brilliant, bold, you know, artists in the room. And I hate that I cannot hire you all. He says, but what I can tell you is you don't have to wait for me to hire you and to put you on a stage. Create your own, whether it's theater in the park. And now with what we can do with technology and, you know, and social media, I am telling my, the artists that I know, especially the young ones, to think beyond what people have put in place for you and do it yourself. We have to do for you, for us, by us, right? And so, you know, I have a really close friend who is finally, she says she has arrived because she is working for a major animation company. And I told her, I said, with the talent that you have, I want you to create your own team. I want you to create your own company and use this only as a platform in order to do and put those, your creative you know, uh, talents and gifts and those who you've known who've come through the ranks with you in those places. Think bigger than what they have set out for us to, for the, how they have set out for us to think. So in my mind, every day when I wake up, I'm thinking collective power. How can I call Valerie? How can I call Sharon and say, this is how we put our money together. This is how we put our talents and our gifts together and create our own because we can no longer wait for them to do it for us. I 100% agree with creating our own and doing our own work. <clears throat> the reality is, is that we are in a system that has been created on top of systems, right? Mm -hmm. So the system of what theater is, right? If black people do theater and really talk about their own stories, they label it the Chitlin circuit. If that same play goes to a regional theater, it's on its way to Broadway and it can, uh, and they can do that work. And so I think it's also a part of how do we look at the systems? It's, 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 a, it's a big problem, right? We have to start somewhere. And I think one of, the, one of the things that we do get in trouble with is that we do have to know everything as Black artists. We have to know how to produce. We have to know how to act. We have to know how to market. We have to know how to fund. We have to know all those pieces to the puzzle. Whereas you have these, these regional theaters that they call up that have people to do all that work. And so I think... I think we can, but we also have to change the mindset of people that if you see a play at a regional theater and you see Val's play or Donald's show at Langston Hughes, that show is just as good, if not better than what you just saw at that regional theater. Why? Because when they came to Langston Hughes, Donald and Val and all the artists was able to bring their entire selves. Mm -hmm. And so we have to have funders 
that believe that we can bring our entire selves. And, and that's not just white funders. That's not just black funders. That's that collective partnership that we bring together to say, look, I believe in your work for you to be just who you are. And then I'm going to help you. Why can't a show that comes from the stage of wherever Val and Donald or CD Form or Deidre or Toya is doing work, why can't that work go from where it was in the community to Broadway by missing some steps? We let children skip grades in school. Why aren't we skipping grades in theater when we know that the work is good? Some of the most powerful work that I've seen has been in readings of black plays that have never hit the stage because, oh, we don't have enough money to produce that show. And like Val said, we don't have enough butts and seats. Enough people aren't going to pay to come and see that show. So there's a, there's a, there's a thing of talking about what we can do now. And there's a thing of, we need people across the world to break down the systems to allow us to move forward. I think just adding, uh, sort of adding a note to all this, I absolutely agree with the idea that we need to make our own. Um, and I want us to get paid. I can make a play anywhere. I have made plays anywhere, but I have not always been paid to make a play. And I love black people, but I also love to be able to stay in my house and to eat dinner and to have clothes on my butt, right? So we need to figure out how to be able to have, to control the means of production and also be able to make bank. I mean, Tyler Perry, whether you love his work or hate his work, the brother writes everything. So he doesn't have to ever pay a royalty to any damn body. He writes all of it. He markets all of it. He, uh, even when he was going out of his car, he got to keep most of every dollar. And he, he wasn't all that different from white producers in terms of how low the cap was on what the actual artist got. Right? So we have to decide how we're going to be sustained by making our art and be encouraged financially to make our art. Artists across the board, not just theater, but across the board, are not recognized for the ways in which we serve the common good. We are, we're like electricity or running water. We're fundamental to the way that humanity works. And there's no system, financial system right now that guarantees us a living wage. And so that becomes part of the struggle. I can absolutely start on my, on my own, but then I have to figure out how my lights stay on. Okay. And when this moratorium on mortgages and rents goes away, how I'm going to stay housed, you know, to be an artist and to be that, um, strapped, financially strapped, that begins to put, put straps on your imagination and on your belief about what's possible. So I, that's why my first thing was equitable funding so that we can be paid to make our things, but, but be self-determining in how that money gets spent is really important to me. Uh -huh. Navra, how are we doing for time? We can take all the time we want in the world. <laughs> um, if we want to, uh, let's keep talking for a bit longer and, and then we'll transition over. Great. I have uh, two, two more kind of big questions that I want to pose to the room. Uh, one is following this thread of everything that's not working and also knowing right now immediately we can't just throw everything out the window what can we like what can we burn down what can we let go what can we get rid of right now to boost us up to build this new world that we're imagining i think it's to get rid of the notion of safe space 
There's no such thing as a uh, safe space in a time of change. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of antithetical. I want to be safe and I want to burn it all down. How does that work exactly? Right? Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as safe space. We have to be brave. Mm -hmm. when, um, when they were crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they weren't thinking I'm going to be safe all the way across. They were thinking when I get there, it's going to be different because I made the crossing. And I want more and more of us to recognize that we just have to be brave. And black people and white people and everyone else getting comfortable with the idea that discomfort is a real thing and it's part of the process. We're not supposed to be safe and comfortable as we go through times like this. I, I definitely don't think that we're going to be safe in terms of uh, not having our feelings hurt, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't be killed because we, we disagree about how the arc gets made, right? That, that's, that, that's a place where safety makes sense. But in terms of like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, have confrontation or conflict. I don't want to be called out. I don't want this. I don't want that. Anything less than actual death, we've got to be ready to roll with it. Thank you, Val. I would like to throw out there that, you know, kind of getting rid of the idea that what we're talking about is imaginary and that it can't happen, just changing our language around, you know, we may be here now and just by simply putting these ideas out into the universe, we're taking that step to make the, those things happen. And, and something that I wanted to say, I can't remember, I think Sharon, when we were, Sharon was saying, we're talking about, you know, we we're talking about money and there was a big um, push during COVID for people to buy black. So I would encourage people to invest in, in black theater makers. And there are organizations here in this town that could use your money. So, you know, I'm sure somebody could put a list together if you're watching this and you want to know October is, you know, giving month, you know, why not also buy the, the plant from the black, uh, nursery, you can also donate some money to a Black theater organization. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steve. One of the things that I thought of about what to change, I think the, uh, the gatekeepers, uh, the idea of a gatekeeper or even the gatekeepers themselves, who is it that's standing there at the gate deciding who's, who comes in? You know, it's like, what is it? Studio 54 in front of the red thing. You know, like you can come in. No, you can't like that. And I used to say, and people would presenters, for example, would get really angry with me for saying this. I said, the whole system is, is, uh, is like a plantation system for, you know, and for black artists, that kind of really kind of is, is it, 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 it kind of resonates uh, in a very particular way because that's how I felt. Often that's how I felt, you know? And so the, uh, I would like to see perhaps in the world, uh, in terms of the theater world, the dance world, about that the, uh, I, I just don't wanna have those people standing in front of white people, st standing in front of the entrances to these places, armor, I mean, it's like the, the that how our police have become militarized, that they're wearing all of this combat armor and stuff to, 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 rather than, and so clearly they are ready to kill people, not to protect people. And so I think it's the same thing with the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers are need to be thinking about not keeping people out, but how many people can we let in? What do we need to do? How we, how, what kind of thinking a structure needs to be there that allows for more people to participate? Not to, I mean, and some of it obviously has to do with elitism. The fewer, the better. 
I would also like to see, and I think maybe this is changing, this notion of as a black person being the only one, or there's just a few, you know, uh, that it should not, when I, if I go into a white institution uh, to make a work or something, I should not be surprised that there are a lot of black people there. Uh -huh. At the moment, usually, if there's more than two, I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Uh, I'm surprised too. Or it's, it becomes a big family reunion. And we be sitting at the Gregory Awards all together, making noise and having a good time. <laughs> um, but also I think it's about thinking that this work is so hard. I am so tired of that. I am so tired of them saying, this work is hard. How do we make these changes? Make the damn changes. What, what do we need to do? We, we've been telling you for years what the changes need to be. It's not like we just started this conversation last year. We started this conversation years and years and people have been telling you, you need to change what you're doing, but you say, oh, it's so hard. How do we make these decisions? How do we change our programming? How do we look at our board and say, oh, how do we just not have it be our white friends? How do we, how do we make sure that our audience isn't just white people in the audience? How do we do all this work? It's, it's as simple as doing it. Hansberry said, if you want to do something, you have to do something. Amen to that. So stop, <laughs> stop trying to play us. And that's 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 tech, that's that's my word. That's how we say it in our in my community. Stop trying to play us like like we don't know. We do know that it's that easy to do. Why? Because we have all these black beautiful people on here doing it. You know, I think um, part of that comes from the fact that when you say all those things are easy to change, they are if you're already changed in here. And that a lot of what's really happening is you, 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 you all should do something, but if it gets to the point, what's hard about it is first I have to change myself, then it would be easy for me to do these changes. And when it gets right down to it, you all, you should divide up the pie differently, that's for sure, but just leave my piece right where it is. It's a, it's a, a fear of relinquishing power. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Which, which implies well, that there is not enough to go around. Yeah. And acknowledging that you individually have something that needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. Don't invite me to a healing circle if you're not willing to do the work at, at home yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love this thing that Valerie just said about the, uh, about the, this notion that there isn't enough. Uh, there's more than enough. And so it is this notion of that, you know, uh, years ago, I would get really angry when somebody got a grant and I didn't get one or they got a commission and I get, I'd just be so mad. <laughs> I'd just be so mad. And then I start to have to do these affirmations in the morning that was like the universe is plentiful. There's enough for everybody, you know? And so it made a huge difference just thinking that the unit there was enough and so i think this i, I think as uh, julie was saying about the uh, about these people they want their part of the pie but it's not the pie is bigger than you just taking a little sliver and the pie is actually bigger than you think it is so I, I think, I mean, I mean, and also we get put in this position to say we, I mean, artists do uh, in this case, artists get put in this position that we are in competition with each other. And in some ways we are in competition with each other, but we, we believe that it is more dire than it is because we believe that resources are limited. And I think one of the things that's happened recently, like with the, I think it was the Doris Duke Foundation and the Ford Foundation, they entered in this thing where they actually are borrowing money so they can give bigger grants to people, to artists. And I think that's really a, a, an incredible thing to do. And that this idea that one of the things like going forward into the future, we have to think about that the universe is plentiful 
I, I think mean, you're right. that you don't manage your resources, you know, but it is, there's a lot out there. And I think you're right, Donald, but also you, ha- you started thinking that way because they made us think that way, right? Because the foundations would only fund in this community, one black organization. They'll fund at Intamine, um, Seattle Rep, uh, Fifth Avenue, but then you have Spectrum. They will fund all those other entities that aren't black and then just have one of us there. So that's what made us think that the resources wasn't plentiful. Like you had to be one or the other. That's what put us against one another was because they would only give to one of the organizations. Oh, why don't y'all all all just merge together as as black organizations and we could just fund one pot? Well, why don't y'all just all merge together and we could just fund one regional theater. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Thanks, y'all. Um, I want to take us into my last formal question. Um, going back to what Deidre said a little bit ago about uh, framing as if this world that we're creating is imaginary. Uh, I think that's not that's not the thing so much, right? But in order in order to build something, right? First, we first have to give ourselves permission to imagine a world that exists outside of the really very white institutions that we exist in currently, right? So we want to imagine and then we want to manifest and then we will build. So the question that I have for everyone in this room is in in this new world with the change that will inevitably come right now in the work that you're doing in the community in your art, with yourself, your circles as a human, what what are you manifesting and what are you bringing? I'm trying to manifest discernment so that I can recognize all the lies. The lies about lack, the lies about my own powerlessness, the lies about how it will never get better, the lies about how every bad thing is everywhere. You know, there are uh, four Ps that add up to pessimism. There is uh, the personal, that it's, it's about me. Everything that's going wrong is about me. That it's pervasive, that everything that's going wrong is everywhere. And that it is permanent. Everything that is going wrong will never change. So personal, pervasive, and permanent leads to pessimistic. So I'm working really hard to recognize the lies that I tell myself or that other people tell me that keep me from having faith and being hopeful for change. So I'm working on that that one. I I ask all the time, is that true? Is that thing that I'm thinking, is it really true? Or is it a lie that I'm telling myself? And if I can discern the difference between a fear, a lie, and a truth, then I have the power, I believe, to change pretty much any circumstance that I encounter. Thank you, Val. You said we can go home now after what Valerie just <laughs> done. <laughs> what are you manifesting? I don't, what I have to say is not as uh, interesting as what Val just said. And, uh, but I think just in answering the question of what, how, what am I manifesting? And I think, and this is kind of new for me. And I think I'm excited about that in general is that I think I'm manifesting generosity. I don't think I'm naturally a generous person. Uh, I have to, I have to work at being generous, but I'm starting to feel now that the generosity is actually is effort is not effortful it's effortless i don't have to work at it so hard to be generous and the primary way i think one of the ways it it, it manifests is so i'm really generous to the people that i work with and 
uh, and I have been in the past often have been uh, demanding to the point where uh, that uh, that I lack generosity, and so I'm happy that I'm able that what I'm manifesting is is generosity, and I and there's something there's a gift that come comes with that that the people that I work with they are really generous towards me on a lot of levels, on an emotional level, it's just, and so I feel, uh, this is, again, I, I feel, uh, it's like love. I, I, I feel something like love. <laughs> and so it makes it really easy and uh, to walk into, even though, you know, virtually walk into a room with people to begin working on something that may and is often with my work, it causes discomfort. Thank you, Donald. I am, uh, I think one of the things I'm manifesting is acceptance of uh, myself and my evolution as a person, a woman, a black woman, and as an artist. Um, and, and knowing that I am more than I um, allow myself to be, um, I think I am just manifesting, accepting that it is okay for me to grow and, and to feel differently than I did last year. And, you know, accepting my role as a leader and uh, a voice that's worthy to be heard. And I think by doing that, I am planting roots for other people to just see me authentically as who I am. Thank you, Deidre. Piggyback off of what Deidre said, um, I am constantly always accepting that I can walk in my light. I'll never forget, um, I was in Brooklyn and, um, and this was probably 20 years ago. I was walking down the street. I was coming from a, a, an art festival and an older man, an elder walked by me and he turned around he said, there is such a bright light around you. And then he just turned back and started walking the other way. And I just stood there. Then he turned back around and said, but it doesn't matter if you don't believe it and see it. Uh -huh. And so I am learning to show myself grace. We walk in this Eurocentric way of being where things have to be done a certain way. There's only one path, you know, way of doing it. And if you don't do it like that, then you don't do it right. And us as Black folks, us as, as beautiful people of color, our, our light and our spirits are so much bigger than that. And so I am telling myself to trust what God has put in me and trust what God has created and allow myself just to be who I am to be and believe that that's enough and know that there's light, that I, I permeate, that I shine light. And like Donald said, you know, you know, sometimes somebody else is doing so well and they're doing other things and you get upset about it. And it's because they're walking their path and you are not seeing yours. So I am always reminding myself to breathe and understand that there, it's okay to say that there's a light around me and it shines bright and I'm brilliant, I'm bold because that's what I tell my children to be. But how, am I, how do I expect them to believe it if I don't see it and manifest it first in myself? So, you know, a lot of times we do that. We carry the burdens of everybody else on our backs and we want to see everybody else. <clears throat> we want to carry everybody else, but first and foremost, take care of ourselves so that we are strong for the people that we love and the community that we support. So it's, it's light for me. Owning the light. Thank you, Toya. Thank you, Toya. I'm gonna, um, with that lovely, lovely, uh, affirmation and manifestation. I'm going to transition us to for the last 15 minutes um, to the community conversation portion of this panel. 
Um, this is a little bit different, y'all attendees, than what you've probably been to before. But I'm going to be inviting everyone who's part of the Zoom webinar to be a part of the conversation and to, to chat together about um, these questions of what is the future of theater and how do we want to reimagine theater. And so in a moment, you're going to be invited to be a panelist. And when you join the meeting, your cameras will be off and you'll be muted. So if you just wanna listen and continue to listen, you can. But if you would like to join the conversation, and add your ideas, you'll be invited to do that. And I'll also invite the panelists, if they'd like to turn off their camera, become more of listeners and foreground community voice, they're welcome to do that. Also to take a break since they've given us so much. Um, of their time and thought uh, for us to converse about. And Alex and I are gonna be in conversation with y'all to bring in some other voice um, as well. So Hattie, if you can move everyone um, into this room so that we can be in conversation with everyone who's here, um, please do that. Um, and as we're transitioning, I will keep talking because I'm good at doing that. Um, <laughs> uh, I would love to, to hear from other BIPOC folks who are on this call who may have had their, their minds racing with their own thoughts and ideas about this central question of, if we could wave a magic wand and change the theater world, what would we create? Um, and I would also, uh, you know, anything that folks would like to share, but I'd love to center the other people, BIPOC folks who are on this call, if y'all would like to share what you've been thinking throughout this panel and your ideas. So feel free to unmute yourself. If you'd like to be on camera, you can be on camera. Nabra? So, yes. Nabra and Hattie, I just wanted to let you know, it looks like the ASL interpreter's camera got turned off. No, they're still there. Uh, they're under interpreter Vanya. So if you want, if you need to pin that, you can do that, but they should be showing up on the live stream. But thank you for that concern. My apologies. Um, <clears throat> okay. Am I unmuted? Yes. Lynette. Okay. My name is Lynette. And I've been thinking, I have never understood uh, why we have so many love between us. I have a disability and I have always faced a lot of ridicule and misunderstanding from people. So the black community, I understand, but I don't look at them as a black community. I look at everybody as a person. And maybe it's because I've, ha I've, I've experienced myself some prejudices. And I think the best way for us to get to break down those barriers is just to be honest with each other, just be ourselves and be free to ask other people, you know, something you, you don't understand, something, ask them. And I, I think that is so freeing uh, because, you know, that's how we get to know each other. And, and I don't like the pretenses, I don't like the, uh, to think, well, what are they going to think if I ask them this? Or, you know, what are they going to think of me uh, being a, a disabled person? Uh, you know, do I, I have to do this a certain way to please them? I don't like that. And I don't think blacks like that either. I don't like, I just, to me, I don't, I have never understood the difference between black people white people, Mexicans, except maybe their, their languages and that, but um, just, if we want freedom, we have to act free. We have to be willing to just take that chance of being ourselves and not trying to be a teacher, you know, trying any pretenses, but just be who we are and ask others, ask questions of others. And as far as the theater goes, or any kind of film, the, the films that I have loved most are films that the black are authentic, like The Color of Purple, um, and a couple other 
films that I've seen that it's just, you know, there's, I, I, I can tell that there's nothing, I mean, there's nothing held back. It's just, it's a thing. And um, that's, that's what I want to say. We, we need to be, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah, share, thank you for sharing your story and the works and the tools that have worked for you as well um, in building that empathy and the truth tell. What I was hearing is also that truth speaks to you. And that's something that has, sounds like it's been resonating throughout this conversation. Yeah, I just, I have enjoyed this conversation just listening to, and I, I just hear so much, why can't we be ourselves? Why do we have to put our masks on? You know, do the things the right way or that, you know? Look, I don't know. Thank you. Are there other folks who want to, who have thoughts or ideas that have sparked from this conversation? Or who have questions that you want to throw out into the world? that may or may not be answered. Hi, I, I'd love to say, hi you guys, this is Shanice speaking. Shanice. How you guys doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and um, um, I, I don't have a whole lot to add. I just, I, I wanna say thank you to, to um, all of my friends. I looked up and all of my friends are on this panel and you guys spoke so much truth um, bravely and um, I think you you captured and echoed so much of what we have spoke about over the years and what we have wished for over the years. And you guys stepped forward and um, shared your heart and um, shared, of course, your expertise and your wisdom. Um, and I just thank you so much uh, because I, I do consider you guys representatives of myself personally. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Shanice. I have a question to throw out to the audience. And that is par particularly, particularly for Black, Indigenous, people of color, or this new term that I picked up from Val just an hour ago, global majority folks in the audience. Uh, what, what makes you, what makes you excited? What do you, what do you want to come to the theater to see? I think I, I this is Shanice again. <laughs> um, I think I want I want to see the truth, and I uh, Val talked about the truth. Sharon talked about the truth, and the truth in storytelling, and that's from all walks of life. I'm I'm so interested in the human experience and um, being able to see an eclective mix of of all stories I think would benefit all of us and right now we see one type of story and then we have um some some sprinkling and some taste testing of other stories and um it I think my internet is messing up you guys I'm sorry about that my internet is weird um but I think I, I think if we capture if we capture, um, if we are able to capture that diversity and inclusion, there's that, all of these different stories. I mean, there's space for it. The Adder, uh, Seattle has so many theaters on so many different levels, small black boxes, mid, mid range, large equity houses, community. There are so many opportunities for so many different stories to be told. Um, I think, I think that that is how we can keep theater alive. That's how we can get people that don't normally go to the theater go uh, coming into the into the doors because they see themselves represented on stage. Um, I I want to see programming that tells the truth in all walks of life, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Janice. Yeah. Hi, this is Naho. I want to thank all of you, all you beautiful people, that amazing people that I've worked with. And this has been so great. And thank you to all, including Shanice. And it's just so much of what was said. You know, I loved what Shan said about why can't we have, you know, season with no white plays or even with the season with white plays. But, you know, what we see on the stage, I mean, I grew up in Japan and check off Cherry Orchard was all Japanese cast because that's where I was living, right? And I didn't think anything of it because that's how it was. And how, why is it that it has to be, like you said, you know, different in the trauma that Deidre talked about of putting these stories on stage and you are performing in front of mostly majority white audiences in most cases. And, you know, yes, the intention to create safe space for BIPOC artists in the rehearsal space, in the theater space, and then you go on stage and it's not safe anymore, you know? And I think that's the expansion of this conversation into our industry, you know, who's coming to see it? Are we, uh, is, are the theaters and institutions creating safe space for all of us to be present and not feel like we're exposing ourselves and it's, you know, no longer a safe space to tell these stories. And it's just so much of changing narrative and what we learned, what theater is supposed to do from whose point of view, whose standard is this, whose perfect is this, whose box office hit, you know, is it mostly probably the people who are coming to see the shows in bigger theaters, you know, but that is not the standard anymore. And who said it was the perfect thing? And I think we just have to start changing the narrative, changing the stories and, you know, changing how we see things. And I just really appreciate all of you for doing this. So thank you. Thank you, Naho. Yeah. Any last thoughts from, from the audience, especially the BIPOC folks in the audience, if, of what you want to see? Um, this is about challenging theaters, about sharing thoughts with theaters so that we can manifest our future. Um, so I want to make sure to hold space in case there are, is anyone else from the community who wants to share? Okay. Seeing none, <laughs> um, I would like to thank these panelists so, so, so much. I cannot thank you enough for being here and taking the time and sharing so much of yourself and your lived experience. Um, it's just been a joy to be here with you all and to hear you um, and to be challenged by you. And I look forward to um, honestly re-listening to this panel and bringing, uh, bringing this back to Seattle Rep as well as I hope other theaters who are watching across the nation and the globe um, will be able to um, manifest what each of you are manifesting and challenging us to work towards uh, soon, not as something imaginary, but something that's coming now. Um, I wanna let you know that we do have three other panels coming up as part of this series. In October, it'll be Reimagine Civic Theater. In November, Reimagine Indigenous Theater. And then in December, Reimagine Accessible Theater. We also have our first of our play reading club coming up called the Kilroy's Club. And the first play that we will be reading is called Before Evening Comes by Filana Moratunwa. So I think everyone who's listening um, and hearing today would be um, interested in all those conversations to deep, dig even deeper. Um, so please join us for that. You can find out more on the Seattle Rep website. And Thank you for coming, that's all I've got. Thank you interpreters as well for being here. Excellent job. Thank you, Alex, for moderating. Excellent yes. job. Thank you, Alex and Nebra Thanks. for bringing us to light.
Thank you, Nebra. Thank you. I just want to, uh, before, before we all leave here, just reiterate what Sharon said in the chat. Please do continue this conversation in your homes, in your socials, in your communities. This is just one beginning of imagining our future. This is by no means the end of the conversation.